which is marvellous. Um, as this is the launch of our new area studies research centre at UEA, uh, apart from um, demonstrating what's being done in um, action in area studies, we also wanted in the course of this day to think a little bit about the current concepts and um, theories of area studies. And those of you who know me uh, will know that that has been something that I have been particularly interested in um, since before I came to UEA, uh, but particularly, and you can see why I felt like I came home when I landed here with all of those wonderful people doing fantastic work uh, all over the world, um, that uh, we have so many people with so many commonalities and shared interests. Um, one of the people that has uh, recently um, become uh, central to our work on area studies has been our next speaker, um, Philip Wilson, who's an Associate Professor of Philosophy and Translation at the University of East Anglia. He teaches philosophy of religion, philosophy of literature and translation studies. His current research interests include philosophy and translation, the novel in new area studies, um, the work and thought of Sivon Vale, whose Mirror of Obedience he's recently translated uh, with Sylvia Hanisi. His monograph on translation and mysticism is forthcoming in 2024 from Ratvich. And he'll also be doing another uh, book with me on area studies as well. So Philip is going to talk to you on the topic of not only rivers and mountains. So take it away, Philip. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you very, thank you very much. OK, let me begin by telling you a story. Um, there was a little while ago, I was checking my email and I got into this email and it said, um, Susan Hodgett has been appointed Professor of Area Studies at our university. And I sat there and I thought, said to myself, what's Area Studies? Well, I looked it up and, and then I began to hear about new Area Studies as well. And from actually total ignorance about the, the topic, I suddenly began to think, actually, this is somewhere where my work in translation and philosophy, in translation and philosophy and at their interface, this is somewhere my research would actually fit really well. So that's kind of the beginning and the middle of my story, which in some ways I think relates to the one Sylvia told at the beginning of the day. And my story ends when I went, it was in the Book Hive, um, which is a lovely independent bookshop in Norwich. I was in there not very long ago and I'd ordered a book and um, Henry said to me, it doesn't like your sort of, the sort of book you'd normally be ordering, Philip, um, he's the owner. And um, I said, well, I said, it's for area studies. And Henry said, what's area studies? And, and I was able to tell him, and I felt very proud of that. And I then started to talk about new area studies, and one of the assistants was there. And I said, so you see, the thing about new area studies is that it's not only the rivers and mountains. And the assistant suddenly said, it's also the stories that are told there. I said, yes, it's also the stories that are told there. Well, this talk, Not Only Rivers and Mountains, is based on a paper I've written in the journal New Area Studies. Um, I'm not just rehearsing the paper, though. I'm actually going to take a couple of points from it and I'm going to try and push them further into some new areas of research. This talk should be very much seen, I think, in tandem with the talk later today by Zoran, to whom, in fact, I owe my title. So story, eh? Well, here's the accusation, storytelling, and I quote from White et al. Area studies was accused by its many enemies as lacking rigour. This is area studies, not new area studies. Area studies was accused by its many enemies as lacking rigour, eschewing the building of broader generalisations for mere description and worse, storytelling. Wow, what an accusation. And I, when I read that, I thought, that's very odd, isn't it? How can you avoid telling stories? So I took myself off to the history department here at UEA and I spoke to a historian. I said, you know, you're, you're historians, aren't you? You write stories. I mean, can you not write can you really not write a story? And his son said to me, well, you could always write a chronicle. So I went off and had a look. And here's the, um, here's the earliest chronicle in England. This is English. This is the Anglo-Saxon chronicle. Um, and this is available in C and D manuscripts. Let me read to you for, uh, in Anglo-Saxon from the C manuscript. This is the entry for 1028, my translations underneath. Herr Knut King for to Norwegen mit a 50 shipum. Here King Canute travelled to Norway with 50 ships. And there's the entry for 1029 underneath it. Apparently nothing happened in that year. OK, um, and only one thing happened in 1028. And um, so that's that's a chronicle for you. Um, but of course, 
you can already see some interesting things going on. If you actually look at the D Chronicle, for example, the D version, you'll find actually they do have an entry for 1029. So maybe something was going on there. And even the entry on Canute, although it's pretty brief, you can sort of see a story starting to emerge. I mean, what's he going to Norway with 50 ships for? It's probably not on holiday, is it? There's probably something going on there, probably something that the readers would actually know about. And therefore, the 50 ships is actually significant in that. So already we're seeing the beginnings here, chronicle, story, history. And of course, um, if you look at, say, European languages, um, many of them, many of the Indo-European ones, do actually share a word for history and story. Think of, for example, the French histoire, which can mean either a history or a story. Think of the German Geschichte, which can mean a history or a story. We seem to have some sort of, I don't know, blend going on, but certainly something very interesting going on. So can we actually push this any further? Well, somebody who pushed this further was the novelist E.M. Forster. He wrote this great book called Aspects of the Novel, and he looked at this very simple sentence, and he said, the king died, and then the queen died. And he said, that's a story. The king died and then the queen died of grief. That's a plot. And that's kind of what historians do, isn't it? Historians are like sort of, they're like sort of lining up dominoes and pushing them and seeing, you know, what led to what. The king died and then the queen died of grief. That's a plot. Now, we mustn't get conf you know, too hung up about these words and we mustn't get essentialist and think that plot, story, narrative have essential meanings. It's just, but it is important to know what we actually mean by them in context. So I'm gonna use John Mullen's um, definitions. The story is what happens. We can actually capture an event. Canute went somewhere, the king died. We can actually have the plot, how it's constructed, the queen died of grief. We're actually putting our dominoes up at this point. And then there's a narrative, and that's how we actually tell the story. This is how Mullen defines the term, how the story is told. So, for example, Canute is actually the main focus of that Anglo-Saxon chronicle. The king and the queen are the main focus of E.M. Forster's example. You might decide to tell a story in the first person. If I said to you, what do you do at the weekend? I'm sure you'd start saying, well, I did this and I did that. Or you might start, you might decide to use the passive voice if you're telling a story. War was declared by Canute, you might say. That's using the passive voice. So we seem to have something which to me seems basic for us. And a lot of research is going to support this. Let's take Mark Turner's work, for example, on story. And he actually talks about story as parable. And Turner actually says that the mind is literary. Now, I'm sure you've had this experience at some point. You're on your way to a meeting and you've got the agenda. You've got your one copy of the agenda and you've got to photocopy it for the meeting. You've left it a bit late, but it, you put it into the photocopy. You press the button and out comes some sort of chewed up rag. And you think, oh, no, you run into the meeting and you say the photocopier chewed up my document. And Turner says there, you've got a perfect story. We've already had beginning, middle and end mentioned today. Uh, but here we've got a beginning, a middle and an end. We've got an actor, the photocopy. Now, photocopiers aren't real, are they? Photocopiers are machines. And yet this is actually an actor in the story. We've got an action chewing up. Now, again, Chewing up is something we'd normally associate with people, dogs, I guess. But no, we're actually saying it chewed it up. We're actually imposing our views of being human onto the photocopier. And we've got something that actually gets acted upon as well. We've got the end of the story. We've got a beginning, a middle and an end. We've got the agent. We've got an action. We've got the object. We've got what happens. We've got the plot, what's going on there, what's the meaning to me, and we've got how it's told as well. Look at that exclamation mark at the end, for example. It's being told pretty dramatically. And I think that's actually even happening in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. They're trying to write a chronicle. They're trying to give bare facts. But even then, by selecting Canute, they're, be they're actually making a choice. We're looking at the king. He's the person who interests us in that year. And obviously, some writers of the manuscript 
thought that nothing of any importance happened the next year, presumably because Canute didn't do much that year. Well, let me illustrate now how story can be useful in one of my own fields, which is translation. Um, now, again, you may think that what translation is, it's a kind of automatic process. Um, you know, you just uh, sit there with a dictionary and you transfer words, you know, magisterially. Um, but in actual fact, it can be a little bit more complicated than that. Let's take a very, very simple German sentence. Der Kater war im Garten. The cat was, the, I've glossed that as the cat was in the garden. But already there's some a few interesting things going on for the translator here, because the word Carter um, in this context um, could be, well, cat, I've translated it, but it's really implying a tomcat in German. Now, we don't tend to say the talk about tomcats very often in English. Um, you know, whenever I've had a male cat, I just call him the cat rather than the tomcat. And again, look at the picture. If you put that sentence next to the picture, there's a kind of implication that that's Puss in Boots in the garden. So we might translate as Puss in Boots. We're suddenly already at this level, interpretation is coming on. So again, it's something that um, with translation, it's something you have, always have to make clear to students when they start. It's not get this idea of mechanical transference out of your head. So um, this came out very strongly, I thought, in an anthology of Holocaust poetry that was published about four years ago, I guess now, by Jean Bost Beyer and Marianne de Vogt. And in their introduction, they wrote something which, when I read it, I thought, this is absolutely astonishing. Translation is never about getting it right about approximating the form or content of the original, about making a rough copy for those who do not speak Yiddish or Latvian or French. It is about recognising someone else's story, understanding the way the teller has chosen to tell it and passing it on to others. That's a very bold thing to say at the beginning, I think. Translation is never about getting it right because people might immediately start saying, well, don't you have to get the right words? Didn't you have to translate Carter as cat and not as dog? Didn't you have to, you know? But no, 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 they're talking about saying, you know, you've done translation, saying, is that the correct translation? Maybe the wrong question. It's about approximating the formal content. It's about, and at the end, it's about recognizing somebody else's story, understanding the way the teller has chosen to tell it, and passing it on to others. And we've got all the things there that I was talking about, about uh, with from Ian Forster there. We've got the story, the story that's told, the plot, how that story is going to function, and the narrative, the way it's told. And only then, when you've actually understood that, are you going to be as a translator in a process, in a position to pass it on to others. Now, in that Holocaust anthology, it's a, it's a wonderful book published by Art Publications, highly recommend it. Um, I was asked to translate um, about three or four po poems for it. And one of them I translated was a poem by an unknown youth. Now, this unknown youth is still unknown. It's known that nobody has a clue who he was. He was in Plötzensee prison in 1942. There's a picture of it. And he, while he was there, he wrote a poem which has somehow, by some sort of miracle, it has survived. And I feel very proud to be able to read out his words today. And to the best of my knowledge, this is only the second time his words have actually been read aloud to an audience in English. So let me actually read this to you. And I think we'll be able to see, looking at the translation as well, that, OK, it's a poem and it's structured. If you look carefully, he's got various patternings going on. But at the same time, there's a story here. 19 selig und zwei. 19 draußen in der Weite. Zwei in diesem einerlei. Kalte, graue, hohe Mauern. I am 19 plus two. 19 out in the world, two in this monotony. These cold, these high walls of grey. And again, we can see the three aspects going on. We've got the story of this young man who's been sent to prison in Nazi Germany. We've got how he's plotting it. So he's actually dividing his life 
into two, 19 and two. 19 where he was actually alive, as it were, and then these two where he's been effectively dead. And we've actually got the way he has chosen to tell it. He's chosen to tell it through a poem. And I think poem, people often turn to poetry. There's a lovely quote I once heard, it's anonymous. Someone said, um, songs are sung out when ordinary language no longer suffices. I think the same is true of poetry. Poems, poems are sung out when ordinary language no longer suffices. Let's move on to some new ground then. Okay, there was this attack on narrative, but why? Why attack narrative? I'm gonna, I thought of two reasons why people might actually be attacking storytelling. And I'm actually going to use um, one of my favorite philosophers who's Ludwig Wittgenstein to try and defend narrative story plot. And I thought, well, yeah, first of all, let's attack storytelling because we want to keep out emotion. We want to make the inquiry scientific. It's something that happens a lot in philosophy, is this. Stanley Cavell, for example, has written a lot about philosophy and film. And he says by doing this, he's encountered a lot of hostility because people say to him, no, 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 no. You cannot get um, bring emotion and passion into philosophy. Philosophy is about reason. You know, it's the single philosopher sitting there reasoning. And Cavell says, well, can't you disagree with that? And again, if you look at the work of Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein is what, says what philosophy is, is about ordinary language. It's about the forms of life that people lead. It's about the language games that people play. And of course, once you start looking at people's language games, emotion and passion, they belong there. So Cavell says, yeah, let's bring film in. And I think Cavell, had he been here this morning, would have been delighted the fact that we've actually had two films this morning. Let's bring the film in, let's, let's bring the passion in, let's bring the emotion in, let's, because we can't really keep it out. I then thought, anything else? And I thought, well, maybe these people were thinking, you know, if you tell stories, you know, you just say what you want, say anything you like. You have all these loads of stories contradicting each other, et cetera, et cetera. You know, again, you know, we, we just don't want that. We don't want an anything goes attitude. Well, I think Wittgenstein's got a great answer for that. Now, if you don't know Wittgenstein's work, um, this is my favourite, favourite quote from Wittgenstein. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Um, that's the famous Duck Rabbit by Jastrow that Wittgenstein looked at. And, you know, Wittgenstein said, is that, you know, what is that? Is it a duck? Is it a rabbit? A duck and a rabbit? You know, um, let's think about it. Um, but he says this, he has a sort of reader speaking to him. Because his, uh, this is from the Philosophical Investigations, which is a very dialogical book. And it says, should it be said that I'm using a word whose meaning I don't know, and so I'm talking nonsense. That's the question. Should it be said that I'm using a word whose meaning I don't know, and so I'm talking nonsense? And here's the answer, and I think it's wonderful. He said, say what you please, so long as it does not prevent you seeing think how things are. And when you see that, there will be some things that you won't say. And I think it's the important thing. Yeah, look at the facts. Look at how things are. Do your research, examine things, and then say what you want. Because if you keep looking at how things are, there's going to be some things that you won't say. And if you say at this point, but we could end up with more than one story. Well, why not? You know, uh, Brecht said we should stuff stories in our pockets like newspapers. Here's an example. Again, I'm going to use translation as, as an example. Um, a translation issue, and again, it's from Holocaust studies. Um, I don't know if you came across this, but there was a, it was actually filmed. There was a libel case brought against the American historian Deborah Lipstadt by the um, British, I'll call him a historian, which is probably ch over charitable, the British historian David Irving. And um, Irving, of course, was a notorious Holocaust denier. And Interestingly, at the court case, a translation issue came up, which doesn't often happen. And it came up about this word, Feldöfen. Now, let's translate that literally. Uh, it's not too far from the English, so Feldfield, Öfen, it's a plural, ovens. 
Now, these, this, the context of this was uh, field ovens at the concentration camp, extermination camp of Auschwitz. Now, Lipstadt maintained that these were field ovens. Another possibility might be portable ovens, movable ovens, and they were there to burn the bodies of those who had been murdered at the camp. Irving said that was a wrong translation. He said the actual correct translation was portable canteens. These were being moved around to feed the Jewish refugees whom the Nazis were very kindly looking after in this refugee camp. And the court actually, it's not often courts rule on translation, but the courts actually ruled in favour of Lipstadt because they said only by denying the Holocaust could you actually come up with a translation of portable, cant of movable canteens, whatever you want to call it. If you Once you actually look at how things are, you're going to have to come up with a translation like field ovens, portable ovens, portable incinerators. Again, as Jean Bosby and Marin de Folk say, we're not saying one of those is particularly correct, but we certainly can have a wrong answer there. And we actually have to look at the overall story of the Holocaust, which is going on there as well. So what can we draw from all this? I think the first thing we can draw out of the conclusion is the importance of storytelling as a tool. Clearly, what matters are the facts, what happened, what happens. Then what is important is how we see them as a plot and then how we tell the story ourselves as a narrative. Now, I think it's always the case that if you're actually if you actually start thinking about concepts, you're in a better position to deal with them. If you think about story, you're in a better position to tell a story. And I would go as far as to say that the success of New Era studies is depending on storytelling. And I think that's one thing that came out before the break. Um, the, the word itself was used several times and people talk about people telling their stories, for example, in these impact um, cases we were listening to. So I think if New Era studies is going to flourish, and I am confident it will, then it's, the stress on story will be important. Secondly, story can become a resource. Now, if you take Pride and Prejudice, for example, there's an illustration from it on the right. Now, historians can mine Pride and Prejudice for details. And um, if you want to know how people dressed in, so what year is that? It's uh, around the Napoleonic Wars, and it's about 1812. Uh, you can, if you want to know how people dressed, you know, Jane Austen's a good source. If you want to know um, marriage um, arrangements at that time, then Jane Austen is a good source. How the upper classes lived, of course. And of course, it's very important what she doesn't talk about. You know, she doesn't mention slavery. She doesn't mention the Napoleonic Wars. Although, of course, it is very suspicious that there seem to be so many officers there um, who are ready to go to the dances with these young ladies. What, you know, what are they doing there? That's a different story. But of course, Pride and Prejudice does show what it feels like to be a young woman in love in that world. It has cognitive effects on its readers. Now, I'm going to guess in this room that not many of you are researching what it feels like to be a young woman in love in 1815. But once you admit that Jane Austen can do that, you actually admit the novel as a resource tool, as a research tool. Any novel potentially can be a research tool once you admit that Austen can do that. And let's actually now look at two novels which might actually function as research tools, but I think function in very different ways. Here's the first. Six. It was a bestseller. It's a, the statistics are astonishing. Thirty million copies sold. That's something. And of course, on top of that, you have to build in the enormous success of the film Gone with the Wind, which is one of the most successful films ever made. And it tells a story, doesn't it, about the antebellum South? Now, recently. Last year, I think um, Sarah Churchwell, who used to teach here at UEA, um, Sarah Churchwell published a book called The Wrath to Come. And look at the subtitle, Gone with the Wind and the Lies America Tells. 
This is a study of Gone with the Wind as I think what Charles Taylor would call an imaginary. Taylor's got this notion of the imaginary that things like novels, plays, etc., and um, religions can create an imaginary, something that everyone kind of believes in and that therefore influences the way we live. And um, myth, I suppose, as well. There's a, there's a mythology in Gone with the Wind. And as you can see from the subtitle of Churchwell's book, Churchwell is actually saying, this is a myth we need to ha handle with great care. But this has been a harmful myth. This has been a myth that's done wrong in the world. This is a myth that needs, en it needs challenging, it needs encouraging, it needs critical engagement. Let's try a more positive example. Um, last year, again, um, I just picked this novel up, Oyen Cam Braithwaite, My Sister, the Serial Killer. I say I picked it up, I then couldn't put it down. Um, I really, really recommend it. It's not, not a long novel. And, and to me, it, it, I just couldn't put it down because it, it just gripped me because um, it had this great plot. It has this plot about a nurse who discovers that her sister's boyfriends start disappearing mysteriously. And this is set in Nigeria. And what's the, what is the sister going to do when she suddenly finds that her sister is now going out with a man she rather likes herself? And she thinks, and my sister's probably going to kill him by the end of the month. What should I do? And I like this for a number of reasons. I like it because it has this clash between duty and inclination, because the narrator has got a duty really to save lives, but at the same time, she wants to help her sister. And in fact, shouldn't that be her duty towards her sister? But I also felt very gripped by this novel because it, it was showing me, how does it feel to be a young woman in Nigerian society? in the 21st century, dealing with misogyny, dealing with the conflicts um, between duty and inclination, falling in love, having to deal, for example, with a corrupt police force. Even the traffic police in the novel are corrupt. Braithwaite in interviews has actually stressed that there is no universal Nigerian experience to be captured. She says, people often say to me, oh, you have captured what it's like to be Nigerian. And she says, no, I haven't. I've shown an aspect. I've shown a variation on a theme. There are many Nigerian stories. Susan Hodgett has argued that in order to understand a place better, a researcher must find out what it feels like to be there. Literature can, I'll just read that again. In order to understand a place better, a researcher must find out what it feels like to be there. Literature can aid in that task because it causes poetic effects in its readers. It can therefore be a research tool. So what, at the end of the day, are we dealing with? We're dealing with our capacity to capture and recount events as they unfold in space and time. That's what Boxall says. Our capacity to capture and recount events as they unfold in space and time. Don't wish to be dramatic. I just need to sit down. Okay. Oh, it's so hot. So I think that's what narrative can do. Wittgenstein said that a dog can be happy when the master or the mistress comes home. So, you know, I'm at home, dog run, I'm, I come in. Sorry, I come in rather. The dog gets up, the dog says, oh, wow, he's home. The dog goes crazy running around the home. And I feel very happy. But I said, a dog cannot sit there and hope and wonder what it's going to be doing next Wednesday. A dog can't actually sit back and think, wasn't it great when I was one year old and we went on that excursion to Blackpool? A dog can't do that. But we can do that. We can actually capture and recount events as they unfold in time and space. And that's kind of miraculous. And that's actually the basis of story. And therefore to say we don't want storytelling, you know, want to keep that out of new era studies, seems to me a grave, well, I'll go as far as say a grave category error. Now I began this lecture with a story. I wonder if you can still remember anything to do with it, because if you remember I said, yeah, I was at my email, and I found there's an email about the appointment of Susan, Aries Studies, what is Aries Studies? 
I began to get involved in area studies and then I ended up in the book hive, independent bookshop in town. What if you did remember any of that? I would imagine some of you did remember things like that because story has got a habit of sticking in the mind. Because at the end of the day, we have rivers and mountains and they're wonderful things. And yet, the world is more than just rivers and mountains because it's not just rivers and mountains. It is the stories that are told about them as well. So in my end is my beginning. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Philip. That was really interesting. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce you now to a pair of jugglers. And you, I was terribly disappointed when they didn't actually bring any um, bean bags or, or like with them flaming, to, torches. To, to flaming torches or swallowing swords uh, <clears throat> for for their paper today. But I have to give them, um, uh, have to have to allow them that because they only were asked to do this presentation two days ago. So, so I have to thank both Tom and Malcolm enormously for stepping in at the last minute to uh, to speak to us today when one of our uh, other speakers, Mandy Sadden, took ill. Um, so I just want to introduce them both to you. They're friends and colleagues. Tom Rees Smith, who is Professor of American Literature and Culture at UEA. Um, he's published widely on a variety of books and articles on 19th century subjects related to people, place and popular culture including most re recently his book, Deep Water, the Mississippi River in the Age of Mark Twain. Um, and his uh, partner in crime here is Malcolm McLaughlin, Associate Professor of Cultural History, also at UEA. And when Malcolm is not investigating seaside circuses, he spends his time working on the history of outdoor sports, travel and adventure. His book is his next book is going to be entitled Adventurelands, the Great Outdoors in the Age of Theodore Roosevelt. And I have not heard what they're going to say, but knowing the two of them, I'm sure it will be entertaining. I look forward to hearing. Thank you. And thanks. Have we heard what we're going? No, I think so. This is the first time. So we'll okay. find out as we go. We've been two days in preparation. Uh, Splendid time is yeah. guaranteed for all. Uh, yeah. and then you mentioned Flaming Torches, though. Uh -huh. I was featured uh, as a school child in the Eastern Daily Press, juggling flaming torches. It's a moment in my career that I've not mentioned before publicly, but it feels like this is um, on some level destiny. Um, so it's going to be quite conversational and relaxed uh, today, which I think is appropriate because in a sense, this project developed out of a series of conversations that took us down some unexpected rabbit holes. Uh, and I think also it's hopefully a, a useful segue from, from Philip's paper that we just heard, because in a sense, this is very much about storytelling. It's about um, the way in which you understand a place, the stories that you tell about a place, in this uh, instance, filtered through um, the history of a circus at the seaside. Um, and also, I guess it's a, 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 the way that we tell stories about disciplines and our disciplinary affili affiliations, because in a, in a sense, this is a slightly meta taste on it, because it's about how we came to understand that the story of a circus at the seaside could be a very rich um, new area studies project. So that's where we begin. And I, I guess maybe we should start by defining what um, we are talking about here, which is um, the foundational moment of uh, an institution in Great Yarmouth, uh, the Great Yarmouth Hippodrome, which is a purpose-built circus constructed in 1903 and still in operation today. Um, Great Yarmouth, for those who don't know, we have a number of international audiences here, is a, um, a seaside town um, in Norfolk, um, still a popular holiday destination, but also um, not without its problems in relation to deprivation, social cohesion. Um, so uh, a very 
rich and interesting site in and of itself. Um, so where do, where do we go here? Yeah. So there we go. This is um, an early picture of the Hippodrome. I'll let you. I'll pass over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Seamlessly. Well, um, here's a photograph of the, the Great Yarmouth Hippodrome as it appeared shortly after it was built in 1903. Um, and it still looks almost exactly the same. Mm. Um, it was founded in uh, uh, 1903 by two uh, circus stars. Um, they, they were um, already well-known, internationally renowned circus performers, George Gilbert and Jenny O'Brien. George Gilbert, born into rather humble circumstances in Norwich, Jenny O'Brien. Um, came from um, an Irish immigrant family to, to England, in fact, grew up speaking Irish. Um, and they went on, uh, they, they joined the circus um, at, at a young age. Um, Jenny came from a, a circus family al al already, um, uh, especially an equestrian, equestrian uh, circus uh, uh, family. Um, and uh, they, they went on to achieve stardom um, appearing in Paris, um, where, where they um, uh, became um, uh, sort of stars of, of, of French circus and then also toured with um, Barnum's uh, circus in the United States as well. Um, so they, they they followed a very conventional circus career path, really, mm -hmm. uh, touring the world. Um, but uh, in the 1890s, they decided to settle down and uh, they uh, moved back to, to, to Norwich. And in Norwich and Great Yarmouth, they operated a series of what were called wooden circuses. So these are kind of temporary circus buildings draped with uh, fantastical cloths and illuminated at the time by electric light. And, uh, and, and, and those really established them in, in Great Yarmouth um, until the, the point came where they were able to build their own purpose-built uh, circus building. Um, incorporating all the, um, the, the the most kind of fanciful um, designs of the time, and and including um, uh, quite quite famously, which is still in operation today, a sinking circus ring filled with water. So it was a great spectacle of circus performance and also aquatic mm -hmm. um, circus performance as as well. Yeah, yeah I, I think I think it's probably when we came across around the time we came across this image as we were starting to poke around to see to because we felt there was something there in relation to this building given its deep history because of course, you know we, you heard we are in a sense coming from an american studies background but i think it was at this point when we discovered that there was a global story here based in this apparently provincial um establishment um that that was that was out on the east coast of england that actually at its core, this was a story that had some really interesting global resonances and uh, particularly through their circus careers. But as, you, as you'll see as we go along through the kind of establishment they managed to construct on the coast in Great Yarmouth. Um, so, yeah, key landmark in Great Yarmouth, as we can see, an important place in the very local history of Norfolk's best known seaside resort. But we also soon came to realisation that this was actually um, what the Hippodrome, Hippodrome represents is a living link to a much wor wider world of seaside circus history. Um, so Lynn Pearson points out in her history of the seaside that most of the pleasure palaces built in the golden age of the British seaside, so roughly last quarter of the 19th century, turn of the 20th century, include the circus in their design. So it was a key part of, of, of seaside coastal identity in Britain, but almost all are now lost, apart from the Hippodrome and um, an establishment in Blackpool, the Blackpool Tower Circus. Um, yeah, I'll continue talking about the heritage. Yeah, so um, uh, we also found that we're, we're not the only people who have <laughs> taken an interest in uh, seaside uh, history and heritage. Um, and there are two scholars um, based at the University of uh, Bournemouth, um, as it happens, um, who have uh, recently written written about, about this subject. Um, from the point of view, actually, of um, so kind of the, the broader English um, coastal, um, so we're, we're sort of super local looking at Great mm -hmm. Yarmouth as a case study. And they've done a survey of, of England and made this point that um, there has been uh, for a long time uh, an, a neglect really of what they call the distinctive heritage of the the, the mass holiday um, in, in England. And I think grow, growing up in, in the UK, um, I went to the seaside. It was very much a part of my, my childhood, mucking about in the sand, building sandcastles, jumping in the freezing cold sea. All that is all good fun, isn't it? Um, but but the, this is this has sort of almost been sort of taken for granted in a way. And uh, uh, Champ, Chapman and, and Bryce sort of directing our attention back to the seaside as a, as a worthy object of, of, of study. Um, and 
what we also discovered <laughs> quite <laughs> rather fortuitously <laughs> and quite late on <laughs> in our thinking about this project which was did seem a moment of serendipity yes uh, was that UEA actually has an archive relating to uh, the, the Great Yarmouth Hippodrome and actually a number of other uh, entertainment sites in Norwich, but especially around um, yeah. Yarmouth, compiled by um, this section of it by someone with a wonderful name, Herbert Tinkler. Yeah. And Herbert Tinkler was a uh, local Great Yarmouth based, eventually lived in Norwich, Great Yarmouth based uh, theatre critic. And Mr Tinkler was uh, an enthusiastic uh, collector, really, of circus memorabilia. Um, this programme uh, that mm -hmm. was represented here is uh, taken uh, an image taken from the Tinkler collection, the Tinkler and Williams collection. Um, and it is from, I think, 1909, uh, 1908, mm -hmm. 1909. Yeah. And uh, we, we believe that actually it was uh, a programme that Mr Tinkler himself collected when he was a child and visited the Hippodrome because he was born in 1902. He was just a young nipper um, when, when this uh, performance uh, was um, on the go. So it was a, it was a rather tremendous uh, collection and an enormously um, rich resource mm -hmm. uh, for studying seaside entertainment, uh, especially in Great Yarmouth. So in a sense, we kind of had a sense of a project here around um, this forgotten heritage, forgotten history of the Hippodrome. And we had an amazing resource right here at the university. But then the question is, what do you do with this story, especially from the disciplinary backgrounds that, that we have? How do you tell this story? Um, especially since um, the British seaside has often been framed in certain ways, nostalgic, hermetic, parochial, um, potentially you know, xenophobic in some, in some instances as well. So how do you tell the story of this institution without making it a project that is in its sense a kind of parochial, hermetic, inward looking margin, if you like? Um, and unsurprisingly, I think, yeah, ultimately, new area studies gave us a framework in which to think about this circus in a way that um, that, that, that spoke to very distinct regional issues, but also some profound global ones as well. Um, it, it immediately, we realised it was kind of sitting at the junction of, I suppose, coastal studies and, and seaside studies. And there's certainly plenty of work on the coast that um, helps us to, to frame ways to think about um, what a seaside circus might mean, what it might mean to, to found a seaside circus and how that might affect both the seaside that it sits in and the circus that takes place inside its walls. Um, so this is from Nicholas Allen et al. Um, Often presumed to be marginal, the coast can better be considered a region of exchange between land and sea, domestic and international space, where relationships and tensions between geography and culture are felt intensely and are played out dynamically. So that's a, that was a very useful, I think, a kind of idea to work with the idea that this coastal space already before the advent of, of this new establishment um, was a place not of um, marginality and exclusion but actually of, of dynamic interchange already but I think it was when we got to um, this um, definition by new area studies um, scholar and circus scholar Charles Batson um, that really pushed us towards a, a way to tell the story of the Hippodrome in a way that, that seemed to um, open it up in disciplinary terms in very interesting ways. So Charles Batson has, has defined um, circus as a quintessential area studies subject um, situated at the intersection of the distinctly local and the avowedly global. And that struck us immediately as a, a perfect way to define this place, this space and the way that it operated um, within a community. Um, as as we as we went on to discover, so yeah, so and that's in a sense the two parts of of the story that we have been um, exploring thus far. The way in which this was an institution that was you know profoundly local in its significance, but also avowedly global. Um, so we'll start with the distinctly local. Should I? Uh, should I? Yeah, I'll pass it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, in no, a sense, no, that's yeah, how we pick things up. up yeah. Was, yeah. So yes, at a certain level, this is a a hyper local story and that's what been one of the pleasures in a sense of um, exploring it through the Tinkler archive and also particularly through the local press because you can see this circus come into being and um, fit into a much larger story about Great Yarmouth as a seaside town and you know, therefore larger stories about the seaside as a place. Um, you can you can trace its um, genesis through local council meetings, um, through tensions around uh, licensing rules um, through community concerns that um, 
perhaps this was an establishment that was going to change the nature of life in Yarmouth in ways that some people didn't like, who wanted to keep it uh, as a smaller town, more connected perhaps to its seaside, uh, to its fishing heritage rather than its touristic uh, existence, um, who were uncomfortable with what it might mean to have a circus embedded permanently in a community rather than as a transient um, entertainment space that came and went. Um, but on the other hand, you can also see the way that the Hippodromes Foundation fitted into a much bigger plan for the town in this period, which was a moment of attempted expansion by um, Great Yarmouth business entrepreneurs and, and the local council. Um, the Hippodrome is built at the same time as um, piers get extended and refreshed, and um, Great Yarmouth famously uh, buys a second-hand winter garden from Torquay, <laughs> which, which doesn't sound that ambitious necessarily, but you know, it was uh, it was still expansive. Uh, and that winter garden is actually undergoing a, a project of refurbishment at the, uh, at the moment as well. So that's another part of seaside heritage that is, that is being explored. Yeah, but so it's clear that ultimately the Hippodrome as, a, as an establishment fitted into this expansive moment of, of, of tourist life in Great Yarmouth. But one of the really interesting things to look at, I think, in, in relation to its establishment is the ways in which Gilbert and O'Brien made sure that this was an establishment that actually did speak to its local community. Um, and for the project thus far, we've zoomed in just in its foundational year in 1903, uh, and in fact, the, the first few months of its opening season. And throughout that time, what you can see is Gilbert O'Brien building community links through a sustained um, programme of philanthropy, largely. Um, primarily, uh, fundraising events which were directed specifically at the town's maritime community. Um, so uh, widows and orphans of drowned seamen, of, of drowned fisher, fishing, fishing uh, workers um, are frequently entertained at the Hippodrome. Um, and one major incident takes place during the opening season of the Hippodrome when a tourist boat um, from uh, London, because uh, you get a steamboat from London to Yarmouth in those days, um, ran down a, a smaller boat leading to the death of about four members of the local community who were also lifeboatmen and a couple of holiday makers. And as soon as that incident happens, you can see the Hippodrome kind of jump into action at the vanguard of um, fundraising activities for the community. And um, Gilbert and O'Brien taking a very conspicuous role in that, uh, in linking themselves up to the great and the good of the town, the mayor, the mayor's benevolence fund, um, putting on yeah, fundraisers for, um, for the bereaved and their families. Um, and in that way, I think making some really in interesting connections between um, the traditional occupations of Great Yarmouth as a town in relation to its fishing fleet and its, its boating industry, its maritime industry, and attempting to establish this is an institution which is um, part of the town in a very meaningful and community oriented way. So, yeah, so on the one hand, a very local story. But on the other hand, I think this was what was also very exciting, um, a profoundly global story that um, very much picked up on uh, the global history of uh, Gilbert and O'Brien themselves within the, the wider network of global circus. So I yeah, so you. should I just sort of yes. wrap things up from here and, and pick that, that part of the story up? So Great Yarmouth itself was a maritime town, a port city in the British Empire at the time, um, was already connected um, to, to the wider world through uh, uh, well, the sea. Um, and it was a fishing port and um, uh, at the time herring, a huge industry in Great Yarmouth and uh, people would come from all over Europe, uh, especially to um, buy as merchants, buy, you know, great crates of, of herring and, and, and take them off back to um, to, to sell in their homelands. Uh, Russia was a great big, uh, the Russian Empire was a great big uh, customer. Um, but the, the Hippodrome brought or connected Great Yarmouth into um, a, a far sort of greater, I suppose, constellation of, of um, visiting um, uh, guests from, from around the world, a very kind of cosmopolitan um, a circus is very cosmopolitan, um, very much a kind of global um, um, uh, uh, entertainment form. And, and Great Yarmouth um, brought those stars from around the world um, to, to, to the, uh, the Hippodrome, brought them to, to, to Great Yarmouth. Um, and so it created this sort of wonderful, um, vibrant um, uh, centre in, in the town. And one of the things we've spoken about in relation to circus is that where you have a touring circus that moves from mm. place to place, um, that, that creates a kind of wonderful moment when the circus arrives in town. And what the Hippodrome did was that it, it created a kind of permanent um, uh, 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 site of uh, excitement in, in, in the town uh, where stars from around the world would sort of circulate through. 
Um, so the circus was always in town is the way we've yeah. sort of been thinking about this. Um, and so we've done some research into, and I'll just summarise very um, quickly, some research into the um, the modern entertainment circuits that um, allowed the Hippodrome to um, book various acts who were coming to the UK to tour around all these different uh, palaces of entertainment that we've spoken about that have been lost. Um, there was a huge business. And then actually, if you if you look at the British Newspaper Archive, which is a tremendous resource for understanding this, you can tr track the journeys that those entertainers had made around the UK before they'd arrived at the Great Yarmouth Hippodrome and where they went to afterwards. So we've been able to reconstruct just in that very focused moment in 1903, um, the uh, basically the the, the bill um, uh, that um, uh, uh, was there in the opening season. Um, as a local journalist put it, Mr. Gilbert has literally um, got the pick of the world's acrobats, gymnasts, trick cyclists, swimmers, equestrians and artists of every possible um, description. Um, people from all nations came through um, the Great Yarmouth Hippodrome. One of its opening acts was um, billed as the, the only girl lion tamer in the world. She wasn't actually a girl, but she did a good act of being a little girl. Um, she was from, from Austria. Um, they also had the uh, world famous Paul Spadoni. Here's a poster from when he was in New York performing, um, juggling a cannon. Um, but actually that was one of the, his, his trick was, was actually coming on stage in a horse and cart, yeah. disassembling the cart and juggling <laughs> the various parts. Um, he was a tremendous uh, uh, juggler. And um, here also um, animal acts. Uh, we have uh, Permain's bears, uh, but, uh, when they weren't escaping, there are many examples of this. Um, Permain had his bears doing tricks like, um, tightrope walking and, and drinking. Uh, Clown Zertho, who had performed in St. Petersburg and Madrid, also appeared at Great Yarmouth that season with his performing dogs. Um, the Martifi uh, troupe of uh, Serbian acrobats here in a kind of um, sentimentalized uh, native costume. Um, and one of my personal favorites, um, the human serpent, um, uh, the king of contortions, um, who uh, has uh, uh, come, come to Great Yarmouth from Cuba after appearing, actually making a big splash in, in Britain um, in uh, the, uh, uh, the, the months before. Or here, um, Mr. Durrell, a famous mm. log roller from, from Canada, um, here performing elsewhere. But also, I think Durrell has a nice, um, yeah. uh, make, uh, allows us to make a kind of nice point to finish up, I guess, yeah. which is that he was also connected, wasn't he, Tom, as you described, yeah. with, with the, the local charity work? Yeah, I think there was one particular moment in this in this micro period in the life of Hippodrome that brought these strands together. Um, was part of the charitable um, enterprise of the Hippodrome in this period. Um, uh, George Gilbert had a charity event where he said he would see how long he could try and do log rolling on one of Durrell's logs uh, and lasted two seconds and you know, was sponsored to do that. But then the morning after that, um, Durrell took his log rolling act out into the sea in Great Yarmouth, which seemed like a really amazing moment where all those boundaries get blurred, where you really have the world escaping from the confines of the Hippodrome into the into the wider community of Great Yarmouth, um, where he would put on his log rolling act for uh, for, for charitable donations to um, to this uh, to this to this cause. And so that seemed like a really a moment where the local and the global really came together in one in one moment out in the sea in Great Yarmouth. Uh, and I think that's not to say that we're trying to cast the, the circus ring of the Hippodrome as a kind of utopian multicultural space without problematics in terms of representation or uh, or consumption. Um, obviously, there's lots of orientalization and othering that goes on sometimes in the in the in the framing and the consumption of these circus acts. However, I think. Um, um, it does push against and allows us to tell different stories potentially about a space that we think we might know. Um, we think we might know what it means to to go and visit the circus in Great Yarmouth. We might understand Great Yarmouth as a space. Um, as Madeleine Bunting has recently written, the British seaside has often been linked to a felt sense of Englishness, one that has frequently been used to foster nostalgic, hermetic and even xenophobic visions of national identity, both in the late 19th century and today. Um, Yet as Daniel Birdsey has also powerfully highlighted, coastal spaces have been diverse and inclusive during distinct periods, historically and globally, but have then taken on or been preceded by a contrasting role within emergent politics and practices of racial segregation. So unearthing the forgotten history of the Hippodrome and its founding moments um, allows us to push back against 
certain visions. So I, this is how we conclude, I think, um, that writing the Hippodrome's early history back into our sense of Yarmouth as a place through the lens of new area studies allows us to tell other seaside stories, ones in which Gilbert and O'Brien's circus brought a diverse cast of international artists to this apparently marginal and provincial town, carving out a deeply cosmopolitan, multicultural, carnivalesque space in the heart of a coastal space that was and is already far more global than nostalgic and parochial narratives of the English seaside's past have often suggested. Um, and very finally, uh, crucially as well, I think, this is a story that continues, right? This is, um, yeah, and it still does. Um, so, yeah, so the Hippodrome itself still functions as a circus. A poster from this uh, year's, if, if you live around this region, you'll have seen their posters um, all, all around, dotted around. This is for their, their summer show. Um, they've just finished their Halloween season shortly to begin their, <laughs> their Christmas spectacular. And a picture of the Hippodrome today, um, in, incredibly popular. When I was there in December, it was uh, absolutely ram-packed full um, and I, I think they 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 they, um, they still manage to sort of pull in um, people from mm. uh, vi visiting Yarmouth on holiday, but also people from the local region. It's very important to them. But also, crucially, mm. they're very, very proud of the fact that they, they book acts from around the world. So that tradition um, that Gilbert and O'Brien uh, started, which is really, I guess, built into circus really yeah. as an entertainment form of, of being a kind of a, a place of um, entertainment that draws on stars of, of circus from around the world. Um, very much continues there uh, to this day. Um, yeah, should we nod as well? Just to oh, yeah, we should, uh, yes, of course. Yeah, and actually, also we circus in Great Yarmouth has actually a much bigger uh, social and cultural mm. role as well, because um, also home to organisations like Out There Arts, who um, who are very keen to make Great Yarmouth the um, the, the the national centre for circus and circus arts um, in the UK. So really, I think what we're also trying to do with this project is is note that whilst we're trying to perhaps shift the sense of Great Yarmouth's past, we're also trying to link up that past very much to a very vibrant and um, uh, and and uh, vivid contemporary scene, which um, does much of the same work. And they're based um, in one of the uh, most deprived wards in, in the whole of the UK, in Great Yarmouth. As mm. many of you will know, I'm sure uh, seaside towns are often some of the most economically deprived. Um, and they their mission is to uh, bring to Great Yarmouth um, outstanding public uh, mm. circus performance uh, because it's tremendously good fun, um, but also through that to do great community work, to bring uh, the community together. Um, there's a mm. whole other story in there, yes. which I won't rehearse uh, today, <laughs> um, but Great Yarmouth has a, a, a number of sort of divided communities and there's a lot of great work that, that arts are doing to sort of bring that community together and create a really um, strong uh, sense of community through circus. Ta -da. Ta -da. <laughs>
uh, in, in recent years, and it was quite outstanding. And it raised so many questions which chimed with me in terms of what is new area studies? Where is it going? Where has it come from? And what's its future? So I imposed upon him, literally, um, to uh, come out of his retirement and speak to us about this because it just was such an excellent article. Um, and I have to say uh, thank you to him for not only is he going to do that, but he's doing it when he's ill. Uh, as you know, he was supposed to be here in uh, Norwich to, to deliver this um, talk in person, but he has come down with the dreaded COVID. Um, but he still kindly said he would do it online for us. So I'm doubly grateful to him today. And I can't wait to hear what he has to say about his opinions on the future of new area studies. Well, thank you, Susan, for this very nice introduction. And I'm indeed very sorry that I cannot be here. I assure you, I, I've gone through a few difficult days, but I'm uh, slightly improving now. So I will probably survive COVID once more. And um, yeah, what, what I do want to do today is basically uh, give you an outline on new area studies as I see them. And parts of these uh, ideas have already been laid down in several pub publications. Um, I think, uh, first of all, I want to say a little bit on my own positionality, my uh, academic career, so to speak, because um, it, it was in certain sense a bit extraordinary, uh, moving from being a mainstream historian to become an area specialist and then uh, in the la last few years, moving into um, broader endeavors. In fact, I've just submitted two chapters to a handbook of social inequality, where I write on social cultures as a means to grasp, grasp how different social inequality is uh, structured in different parts mm -hmm. of this world. Um, so, and during my career, I traveled also uh, quite a lot. So I was exposed to uh, the American ac academia, the Australian one, uh, and I spent a lot of time in my region, in my area, in Southeast Asia, having intensive contacts uh, with Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia. So on the whole, I had the feeling I'm, I'm someone who became transfixed between discipline, in this case history, on the one hand, and area studies on the other hand. And this is difficult because it uh, makes, it creates personal unease. It's much easier to be a, a, a mainstream historian. Uh, um, and I have to ask myself all the time, what am I doing and why do I want to do it differently and so on and so forth. And this is the one part and the other part is the area studies. So, and also in the administrative sense, uh, I uh, went through the ups and downs. I was the director of my area studies center in Berlin. Uh, and uh, we went to several budget cut rounds for which I had to take personal responsibility. So it's very uneasy position I had to take. Now, let me tell you some general things about the development of the field of area studies. Uh, because um, since 1990, after the end of the Cold War, um, it was clear that the area studies as they had been uh, constructed, uh, especially already in the colonial era, but then later on uh, during the Cold War, uh, were on the verge of extinction. Uh, and on the academic front, there was the challenge of uh, globalization studies. Uh, and the expectation that uh, our world would be one of an open cultural exchange and a peaceful and happy world with free trade, etc. So no longer area studies are necessary and uh, we can abandon them. I think there was, a, the, in a way, a political shock to uh, the 9-11 event that suddenly uh, made clear that uh, there are differences in the world and that instead of moving towards an ordered, well-integrated world polity, uh, in fact, we 
and I think this is being driven home still today, that we are living in a quite dangerous multipolar world in which uh, military conflict, social instability, ecological degradation, etc., reign supreme. And in a way, uh, yeah, I think crisis or political crisis has always been good for area studies, for the field of area studies. And uh, since 2001, there has been a re-emergence of area studies or maybe the, uh, the process of the gradual disappearance of area studies has been stopped. Uh, yeah, and at the same time, there was some um, the feeling that the paradigm of uh, globalization and its very concept was not uh, uh, suitable to describe the world as it exists today. And I'm influenced by the work of the American sociologist James Rosenau, who wrote on, uh, he, he refuted the concept of globalization and he wanted to use the processual composite term of fragmentation, so fragmentation and integration at the same time, which was, according to him, a future of distant proximities. And it was uh, on the basis of these uh, developments in the field and also these ideas uh, of Roger now that I start to ask myself very serious questions about area studies and uh, uh, the need to reframe uh, area studies to become so-called new area studies. So, and in order to, uh, yeah, to approach this, I think uh, I felt we need to go back to the basics and simply ask what, what are these new area studies? So what is an area in new area studies? How should new area studies be, be done? Uh, where and when and why? It's a very simple question, but in fact, of course, very complex. Um, but in in an effort to develop a kind of research agenda for the new area studies, which I personally, of course, see as a as a very uh, high potential uh, field of high potential in also in the academic sphere. So next slide, please. <laughs> Right, so let's tackle the first question, the area and new area studies. So the old classic, old area studies, we hard back to the era of colonialism and the period of the Cold War, were basically uh, uh, based upon an essentialist notion of area. So th the area was, was somewhere a, a, a demarcated space in which uh, culture, politics, nationhood, and the like converged. And uh, so there was no, uh, uh, there was no reason. In fact, a, a political map of the world showed you already very clearly, and it's very naming, of course, of the various regions, uh, showed you what areas did exist. And it had uh, deep implications because uh, uh, having worked in several area study centers, uh, area knowledge was produced in a compartmentalized fashion without any substantial cross referentiality. So the the uh, I, I was part of these centers, and what struck me always is that the Southeast Asianists uh, lunched together but never spoke to the Sinologic uh, and the Japanese expert and the African uh, specialists were among themselves and so on and so forth. So the idea of that um, sort of epistemic community of insiders uh, developed uh, side by side without any cross reference. And this was, of course, connected, according to me, to this essentialist notion of area. Now, after 1990, um, yeah, with the um, globalization paradigm taking over, we see indeed that this was broken up. So it was obvious that there was lots of mobility, 
a circulation of ideas, people and goods across boundaries, uh, globe, universal themes such as global trade, migration, social inequality, social movements, religious re revivalisms, ethnic conflict. These were the themes that should be studied and within a global setting, so to speak. But then uh, after 2001, as I already pointed out, there was a return to the area in the study of the world. But I think we need to redefine what an area is. So here I made an effort to do this. And I personally consider area as a particular configuration of places and spatial scales that is meaningful when studying a particular phenomena or development. So it's, it's area as such is not something that is there, but it is an lens to study a particular something in a holistic manner. So it's an area is a caref carefully chosen correlation of place and scale. And that means that area can be stretched or condensed in any direction uh, from local to global. So this is a very flexible um, uh, idea of area, and it simply depends on what you want to study, what the relevant relevant area in your search will be. But it's to be uh, figured out and chosen in a very um, careful manner by the researcher itself. Yeah, there are certain things um, within the area that we have already heard in other papers. Uh, I am very, of course, an advocate of the, the view from within or the view from below, so to speak. It's not for us to impose Western categories on the areas we study, but we are interested in uh, the stories and the storytelling, but the, the way in which people living in these areas make sense of the world. That is essentially, that is very important. Um, and if we work with new spatial formats that are multi-scale, dynamic, uh, there's also the comparative context. I think one of the later speaker will uh, talk about it. And what we will see that is that certain overseen spatial patterns come to light. And we have heard, I uh, just heard on seaside <laughs> as a particular area, uh, but there's the idea of arcs, which was not liked, sea basins, belts, axes, etc. So there are new spatial patterns that are not, not necessarily, if you put it on the map, are even interconnected. Yeah? So if I study uh, Vietnamese di diaspora as an area, I move between the west coast of America, uh, Vietnam itself, but also Eastern Berlin. And this is my area, although they are on three different continents. Now, as a historian, I'm also interested in time. And of course, I no longer uh, interested in the traditional European Enlightenment idea of linear progression through time. Uh, this is what most traditional historians still do. Uh, so they, um, and I think Philip talked about that, that uh, cause effect relations are explained through sequence in linear time. And I think that is completely unsatisfactory because time moves in different directions. So uh, it may also move backward. And this is an idea that is strong in some of the areas I study. And if you look at the French Annal School, they have this very interesting idea of the uh, existence of very different layers of time so that uh, you have events, but you have also conjunctures and long-term structures. 
and they are inter interrelated, but they move at different speeds. So I think we, uh, besides a redefinition of area, we also need a, a redefinition of the time dimension in uh, new area studies. Yeah, uh, regarding the, um, the view from within, of course, there is a bit of a politicized debate uh, on, at least in, in my former institution, on who is entitled to speak uh, on behalf of the area, so to speak. Huh? So can it only be people from the area or are uh, uh, this necessarily only home scholars? Or can anyone with the appropriate skills and experience participate in the conversation? I'm personally I'm an advocate of the latter, so to speak. I think, of course, we need to speak to each other and speak with and uh, people um, in the area and with the vision from the area. But still, the area as a as a lens to understand the world is in principle open to all as scholars of all um, province uh, backgrounds. I think. Uh, but this this is a hot debate in in my institute uh, because uh, I have bad cards as a old white man uh, talking about Southeast Asia. Although the people in Southeast Asia, so if I give a lecture there on my work, uh, I, they uh, they respect my work, so to speak. They recognize many of the things. I talk about and they think they are uh, this is relevant for them. OK, let's move uh, further to the met methods in new area studies. Yeah, uh, it was already pointed out uh, in the reference to Susan's work that the uh, personal exposure to the area um, is very important. Yeah, so the, the embodied experience to be in the area, to uh, have exchanges on a daily basis with uh, the people living there. Uh, and I will remember the first time I came to Indonesia as a young man uh, with my head full of academic wisdom and then the realities on the ground and the, the, the imaginations of the people there were so utterly different from my own. And I think this was an extremely enriching, but also very important uh, experience because it uh, sharpens one's senses for things that are uh, otherwise not seen. If you're not in such an environment, uh, you take many things for granted because they match your own uh, social background or your uh, biographical background. And suddenly you discover that what you think is uh, evident is not at all evident in another place. So that means that established forms of knowledge uh, are being uh, challenged. And this is a very important point of departure for any study in area studies. And in that uh, <laughs> respect, um, yeah, there has been in the last few years of my active Career was a bit of a new trend in my institute to, uh, because of the COVID uh, pandemic, to restrict oneself to, to online research on the area only, so to speak. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical of that. I think online research is fine and important, but the use of Digital media, as we've seen in the morning sessions, is, is a very important tool to execute area studies, but it cannot replace uh, the, ex, uh, the uh, from going there and meeting person to person. So, so I think uh, you really, this essential thing is involved in going through your area. Now I've talked about new methodological approaches. And this morning we have seen that indeed um, areas, classic area studies 
have been at a certain time kind of monodisciplinary exercises. So I've met linguists, anthropologists, historians and the like who specialized on a certain area. And, uh, and they were engaged in monodisciplinary research. Um, and nowadays, as we've seen today, uh, area studies or new area studies have become truly multi or transdisciplinary efforts. And this is, of course, because we we are aware of the alterity, the different uh, qualities areas we study have. And uh, we cannot uh, just um, limit ourselves to have a very narrow approach to the area through one discipline only, so to speak. Now, and uh, yeah, I've, I've been on the lookout for new uh, methodological approaches that can be of interest to develop further for these new area studies. And these are uh, in part new approaches. And I'm, <laughs> I wonder whether all of you have uh, are already familiar with all of them. <laughs> I doubt, <laughs> but uh, and and therefore it's useful. So the 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 first I want to bring up is uh, the result of the work of my late colleague Boyke Rebein. He was a uh, sociologist in my institute, and also a philosopher. And he um, suggests the application of so-called kaleidoscopic dialectics. That was his term which aims at the cognition of connections, relationships, and similarities, but then from all possible angles, rather than strive for an understanding of a single whole. So this is, so what, you, what you're trying to do with area studies, and you must ad adopt your method accordingly, is, is to find, to look for a new kind of knowledge, which is based on connective connections, relationships, similarities. Um, and this is uh, uh, his ideas built upon uh, Norbert Elias concept of figuration, Theodor Adorno, sorry for the philosophers here, concept of constellation or configuration. And of course, Levi Strauss idea of the kaleidoscope. So it's, the idea is that it is in the conflation of different configurations and the multi perspective analysis of their relationships and similarities that the area as, as it emerges. So this is the idea behind kaleidoscopic dialectics. Second suggestion is to look at network analysis again but in a different manner because classical network analysis uh, often focus on the actors and their relationships, their connections and entanglements. And, and so this is, so you follow the act, act, uh, actors as they move within their areas, but uh, uh, that the sociologists point out to us that networks it themselves focuses on the human actor and is not a spatial category and tries to avoid spatial distinction between inner and outer proximity and distance, global and local. But I think I'm not in agreement. I think in contrast, I would argue that re relegating actors to different spatial scales and sort out the qualitative dimensions of their interconnections is an essential part of new area studies. Now, and third uh, suggestion is situation analysis, which is an extension of grounded theory methodology in which uh, the researcher in his or her area creates situational maps of social arenas on the basis of what actors and their discourses convey. And this method in, uh, allows the researcher to include uh, his or her own subjectivity 
allows for epistemic diversity and also the playing out of power asymmetries. Uh, as, um, we have heard much of that earlier on in the, in the, um, in the, in today. Now I move to the to a, an example. So next slide, please. Yeah, so applying new area studies, as was pointed out, I'm basically a historian. I feel most safe as an historian. And I did try to uh, put some of these ideas in to practice in a history monograph on um, yeah, Southeast Asia, Asia, Indonesia, uh, and I call this Histories of Scale. It was published in 2021, and it deals with the imperial age in Indonesian history between 1820 and 1945. Now, I'm not going to outline you the content of the book, because this is not a theme of this uh, talk, but I want to try to explain to you how I try to uh, apply these ideas of new area studies and the methodology. And the starting point was basically accidental. Uh, throughout my many years of uh, work in uh, archives of all kinds in the Netherlands and in Indonesia, I came across so-called cases, uh, primary source materials, uh, which I couldn't place properly uh, because they didn't fit the dominant historiographical narrative of Indonesia on the one hand, but they also did not fit into the field of global history of Asia. And after having thought about new area studies, I think the case studies in this book represent in fact histories of scale in which local, regional, and global histories are interconnected in a particular way. So, and this is what I'm interested in. So central to each chapter is a local event, which then works its way, its way outward across several scales. I assume there is no hierarchy of scales so I call this, it's a rather a lateral view I want to develop, I, a lateral view looking into all directions at the same time. And I call this uh, perspective pericentric. Now, although my cases are all located within the colonial period, there's no simple narrative, no single narrative that connects them. Instead, the meaning of these cases lies in the fact that each of them represents a different, and now there's a new word here. I invented a new term. If you look it up in Wikipedia and you won't find it, it's the so-called topogrome. What is a topogrome? Topogrome are specific space-time configurations in which the nature of the connections between several scales is condensed into a single pattern. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and the next step is that I then, if I uh, develop these patterns and I, I made drawings of these patterns, uh, I ultimately labeled them in a specific way. So topogrones are situational and processional shards that depict the dialectical tension between centripetal and centrifugal forces in the imperial world of Indonesia and Asia in the 19th and 20th century. So I found in my six cases four morphological types uh, which express both a spatial configuration and a movement in a particular directions. And then I used uh, what I call mid-range concept uh, to name these uh, particular configurations. So I have a, a chain, which is a linear connection between the inside and the outside. We have a circuit, which means the circular movement of actors and ideas. 
which creates the imperial space. We have grid, that means a complex multi-scalar constellation. And then finally, I found cascade, which is a quick succession of local events, which had yeah, a global consequence, the downfall of empire in my case. Now, final, final, next slide, please. Am I still on time? Just about, yeah, I think that's fine, yeah. Okay, yeah, this is very quick because this is basically a provocation. <laughs> and there has been, <laughs> I wrote an, in 2020 uh, an article, uh, so the need for new area studies to become a new discipline. And then, of course, I was ripped apart because, uh, uh, yeah, they said, okay, here comes the old ma white male who wants to set up a new hegemonic knowledge system <laughs> that is run from European uni universities, so to speak. But <laughs> my intention is a bit different. Um, uh, I, I during my experience within this field has been that the notion of area studies as a mere study field uh, was uh, not very productive. I had the feeling I was always on the defensive <laughs> in uh, relation to my esteemed uh, colleagues who represent particular disciplines, so to speak. And I think it's a bit of a a provocation to try to formulate uh, what are the, how the conditionalities to become a real discipline. And uh, um, can we uh, state that maybe in the future, new area studies can meet all these conditionalities and then, and now I provoke a lot, even uh, replace the existing social science humanities disciplines by a new integrative format of global social science. And uh, well, in my written paper, I already pointed out, oh, I, I gave you an idea of the subject matters, the theories and methodologies behind such a new studies, area studies endeavor. Uh, and I think there are reasons to believe that if everything goes well, in fact, new area studies will become a discipline. Thank you very much. Hey, and can I ask our speakers to come up to the front, please? We'll get the mics ready. Oh, I think we go there. They can't see us. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll move the camera. You're getting, getting fancy here. Sorry. Hello. Stand or sit. You can sit. It's fine. There we go. It's about. <laughs> Oops. So we have a few minutes now. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Vincent, for, for, for your thoughts um, as a result of a career in doing area studies. And um, I think that's what struck me when I read your article on um, on the future of area studies and your call to create a new discipline, which of course really chimed with um, thoughts that I've been having for some time. And um, I I was really intrigued by your advice as to how how that might be done. So um, we have a few minutes now, just maybe uh, five or ten minutes max. If anybody has any questions for any of our speakers, um, we have one online, it's jugglers or not. Oh, yes, hmm. Tony. Tony Chafer from Portsmouth. Hello, yes, thank you very much indeed for that presentation, which I very much enjoyed. Um, I'm also a historian, and I was just wondering, and you partly answered this question in the very latter part of the presentation. But I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about how you operationalize as a historian the concept of layered as opposed to linear time. Um, it's a concept I'm very interested in. I wondered if you could just say a bit more about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess the question is towards me. 
Well, the, 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 that's the behind the idea of topogron. So, uh, of course, uh, we know gronotopes, uh, and their uh, time is privileged over space, but in the case of area studies, I think there's reasons to turn it around. Um, but it's, it's exactly this uh, interference between uh, space and time that, uh, that creates the area. And, and here, um, and this is what I did in these uh, chapters. So I always started with an event, a local event. And then I went to the next uh, circle, so to speak. So the next, on the next scale. So I went to, to the island of Java. So there was an event in a certain village somewhere, which uh, would never enter any book because it was is not relevant. But if you put it into a uh, context of uh, 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 topogron, this this incident, this this event in this village reveals much about the relationship with other developments going on. And of course, then time becomes slower. The the further away I move from the village, so uh, so there there was a, an attack on colonial officers in a village. And then I talk about the rise of nationalism uh, in, but not nationalism in the secular um, um, enlightened sense, but um, rather the Islamic form of nationalism that was very easy for ordinary people in Javanese villages to pick up. So there was another kind of nationalism developed in this imperial space. And then I move to the next phase. This was the time of the First World War and the disruptions. So as you see, I work my way outwards and then uh, and I, I'm discussing bigger and bigger things throughout this, uh, the, uh, the chapter and times become slower in a way, but uh, but I want to show how these things are interconnected. And I think this is for me the, the most interesting thing of doing area history, so to speak, to, to show these configurations between these various time scales, uh, space, time spaces, <laughs> or I told, uh, 